Resilient Advisor Podcast, the show for high-performing financial advisors. We bring you the best practices of the industry's top performers so that you can build resilience in your business and your personal life. Thanks for downloading this episode of the Resilient Advisor Podcast. My name is Jay Coulter, and joining me for this episode is Mark Parrott. We are going to discuss how you can use demographics to stay relevant and thrive as a financial advisor. Mark is the author of the book Metatrends and the Next Economy, as well as the owner of Creative Retirement Planning. Mark, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Jay. And I really appreciate your time. And I, I got to tell you, I love the love the background information that you've given. And I think you're doing really good work here. It's thanks. Necessary. Mark, I appreciate it. And based on our pre-call, I know we're going to have an interesting conversation here. Let's We could go a, a lot of different directions. Let's start with one of my favorite topics, and that's intellectual property and how it relates to the financial advisor and their practice. Well, I guess, you know, in my opinion, I think we need to add intellectual property to our practices. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up to become extinct. It's whether it's robo-brokers or tendencies of millennials not to want to do business with us or think the answer to, the in, uh, to everything is on the Internet. Or lastly, probably a bigger threat on the long-term horizon would be artificial intelligence and how that's likely to put the majority of all professionals out of business. What I think is if we can add intellectual property to our practices, we can make ourselves indispensable to our clients and hopefully even garner more clients. So let's, uh, let's hang some meat on that. What would that intellectual okay. property look like today? And then how could you see that evolving over time so that you can stay relevant when artificial intelligence becomes a, a threat? Well, I, you know, I think, um, not that I'm an expert in these areas, but I think adding a state or elder law work to a practice makes a ton of sense. The, the way I chose to pivot and to stay relevant going forward is I got a certification as a mergers and acquisitions advisor. Now, that doesn't mean that I practice as one. That also affords me the ability to have a fiduciary relationship with my CEOs. They can trust I'm not there just trying to sell their company because the downside of most M&A advisors, frankly, most advisors, is they're like real estate agents. And when does your real estate agent want you to sell your house? It's today. And that's rarely ever a smart thing to do with a company. It's almost always you have to re-engineer the company in order to create extreme valuation somewhere around maybe five to ten years in advance. So you can actually have that relationship with that, CPA, uh, that's, uh, that CEO for a really long time period and then as the finances when and if they sell. It's also putting you in a position where um, you can actually have the luxury to tell them the truth that it might actually might, might make sense for them to sell where it might make more sense for them to coach a number two on how to take over, that's also intellectual property. Because not only am I certified as an M&A advisor, I get certified as a business coach too. So those are two things that I added to my practice so that it opened up what I would call a counter-cyclical revenue stream to the mom and pops. So let's talk about and go a little bit deeper on the certified M&A advisor. I, and I'd like to learn a little bit about the curriculum and what you walk away with if you go through the program. But really from the application standpoint, if I understand this correctly, okay. you're able to work with the CEOs of small businesses. You're providing advice, but not compensated for that advice. So you're still wearing the fiduciary hat. And then are you mm -hmm. compensated based upon uh, managing their finances, managing their retirement plans? How does that work? Yeah, it's really important, too. So let's break it down into two things. One is what is the certification in mergers and acquisitions and how do you get it? The other is how do you get paid? You know, because if you're not getting paid as a mergers and acquisitions advisor, how are you getting paid? See, um, a friend of mine uh, here on Long Island, uh, I was having a conversation with him about a decade ago, and he had just sold one of the companies for $168 million for an unheard of multiple. And what he had figured out was there's a conflict of interest of mergers and acquisitions advisors. They want you to sell. So he hired two companies. He hired one about a half a decade in advance of the actual transaction, and their job was to create extreme valuation in the company. That's it. They weren't even allowed to participate in the search for who, which firm would actually handle the deal. 
So that eliminated the conflict of interest. And all I did was I sat back and said, why couldn't the financial advisors do that? Be perfect for them. So let's say you develop the relationship, you take over the, the 401k, you manage those assets, and as part of the fee structure of the retainer to manage the 401k, you throw in all sorts of other coaching. You become this wonderful um, angel sitting on their shoulder that they can bounce all sorts of strategic thoughts out, off of, and who's better qualified in those kind of conversations than a, than a financial advisor, much like yourself. So the, that was the impetus of the whole thing. That was about 10 years ago. So what I did was I started reaching out to say, okay, well, how can I find out more about this M&A world? Because frankly, they don't teach us in financial advisor classes how to handle business <laughs> for a small business owner or a medium-sized business owner. Because my average guy is uh, $52 million in revenue. So I wouldn't even call that small business. I would call that the private middle markets myself. Who are the players involved? What are their... Um, uh, let's say their agendas. That's a whole new world for us. That's intellectual property. So to to st- take a step back to your you know, maybe your last question is what's the practical application of this? The organization that I chose was uh, the Alliance of Mergers and Acquisitions Advisors out of Chicago. Mike Null runs that. I think he's the co-founder. The whole board of directors are all M&A advisors, and really what they're trying to do is they're trying to raise the standards in the industry and then deal with regulation too. And what they want to do is certify everybody so that there's more credibility in that space, what have you. It's not just some guy who's you know, done it a few times and calls himself something. Um, so I reached out to him and said, I told him that I present regularly to CEOs of privately held companies across the country, um, averaging $52 million in rev with a, a mean of approximately $32 million. And they were like, let's get you in here. Let's, let's set you up. It's not cheap. It's about $3,500 for the actual certification. It took me about six months of studying for it, much like one of your CFP courses. Um, the situation, though, it was the single hardest test I've ever taken. So I will warn you about that. Um, but that's mainly because I don't just hate accounting. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it makes me question why I'm on this planet like uh, rest the shotgun against my forehead type stuff. So um, I would imagine anyone with better accounting skills than me or you know, their mind works a little differently than mine does, they'll actually handle it a lot easier. Although I am an excellent test taker, it's just accounting throws me for a loop, and I'm, I'm not sure why. But I did pass it. And inside that course, the, the, it's like, actually is the impetus for my next book. Um, I'm going to be calling that one The Secret Stock Market. So maybe there's future conversations you and I can have over that. But I tripped over a theory inside that that is just like, wow, how to create extreme valuation, even for us, even for financial advisors. Well, let's so go. The, um, let's rather than, go, let's mm-hmm. go deeper on how to create extreme valuation as financial advisors. But before you do that, just to kind of wrap sure. this up on the certified M and A designation, yeah. six month program, thirty five hundred dollars, lots of accounting, and a very difficult test. Is that fair? Yes. That's fair to say, all the six months is really in study. In the, in the actual class, is only a week in either Pepperdine or actually one of three locations. Pepperdine in L.A., uh, you get DePaul in Chicago, and you have uh, North Carolina in North Carolina, obviously. So they, they offer this uh, six times a year, two in each location. It is completely worthwhile. The, the catch is you're not going to be sitting in a room with other financial advisors. It's all going to be attorneys and CPAs and maybe like people who are, in, I call them nepotists, like you know the nephew or the son, daughter of uh, the current CEO that sees value in someone being in their think tank that understands that world. All I'm arguing is the ideal person in that case is the financial advisor. There is one other certification, too, if you're dealing with CEOs that tend to acquire as opposed to sell. The acquirers uh, need a different certification. That's a certification in integration. That's out of Pritchard, out of Dallas. I don't have a lot of call for that. That's the only one that's available, and I hear really good things about it. Um, And I've referred a lot of people to it because sometimes small businesses want to buy other businesses, and they need to integrate that properly. So I see that as two ways to add intellectual property to a financial advisor's practice. Excellent. So let's shift gears. Mark, let's talk about adding extreme valuation to a financial advisor's practice. What are your thoughts? And let's put some application on it. 
All right, well, Jay, I, I'm warning you here. This is very eggheadish. And uh, last time I presented this to approximately 100 CEOs, one of them accused me of sounding like a CPA talking to an attorney. <laughs> That's not exactly what I'm shooting for. <laughs> I don't think that was a compliment, <laughs> was it, Mark? <laughs> yeah, it didn't, didn't feel like it. He actually ended up, after the second time he heard the presentation, he did apologize to me because he saw I was there trying to do good work in this world and leave the economy a better place. But basically what it comes down to is Sorbanes-Oxley. Sorbanes-Oxley comes out in 2002, eliminating the Enrons of the world, let's call it, just to keep it quick. Um, what it did, though, is the unintended consequence of trying to protect little old ladies, retirees from Enron, is it eliminated a chief liquidity means for companies. So back uh, when I was helping Merrill Lynch bring companies public back in the early 90s, they were. Uh, it was rumored that you had to be doing about 15 million in red in order to go public, and virtually all MBA work was all about going public back in those days. Now I'm told very few MBA courses even involve it because, frankly, more companies will go private in the next 15 years than will go public in the next 15 years. Well, it turns out that creates an arbitrage. So back then it was 15 million to go re- to go public in revenue. Now the rumor is 300 million in rev. So very few companies are going to go public. So the companies that are public and are already Sorbanes compliant get to create an arbitrage. Arbitrage, the French definition of that is a riskless profit. So what they can do is inquire a private company that now has a very low street value. It seems great to them, the, you know, the owners of these companies, but the publicly traded companies can actually acquire them for street value, and just by acquiring them, they're automatically more valuable. So the way, one of the quick ways to create extreme valuation is to have publicly traded companies in your auction, and nobody knows this. So picture I've presented to about a, uh, 8,000 companies. So I've either directly counseled, surveyed, or presented to about 8,000 in the last eight years. And uh, I'll do about 1,500 this year. Of the 8,000 uh, that I've talked about how to, how to create this um, – call it um, uh, publicly traded pop or uh, secret stock market or whatever phrase I call this, um, of the 8,000, only 30 so far have ever heard of it, and every publicly traded company knows about it. So what it comes down to is the, the ability or the accessibility of a publicly traded company for cheap capital. They can either their Home Depot buy and resell nails or they buy and resell companies, and they are doing it in droves. And the majority of all private companies are, n- are not even aware of this. So now that goes back to the original point for in our conversation is, okay, well, if I'm, how do I add intellectual property? Well, how about teaching them that? Mm-hmm. Man, you can uh, now you take over the 401k. Um, what they really want is they want two M&A firms. They want the one that has a fiduciary relationship with them, and that can be every financial advisor out there who's frankly talented enough or smart enough to handle what we just talked about. And then how do you relate that back to them and get them to recognize there's there's enterprise value in all these companies simply because of the dynamic I just talked about? So um, don't sell the company for an asset sale. So, But understanding... None of my financial planning um, background taught me how to do this. It requires a journey, but that journey is the intellectual property. I got to tell you, it's super cool stuff. And frankly, getting in touch with these guys is a lot easier than you would think. And it doesn't require any fancy marketing. It doesn't require, in fact, it requires the opposite. So when you're ready, I'll be happy to tell you about that stuff too. Of course. Let, let's get into it. I'd love to hear what that call looks like. Okay, so basically, um, it doesn't start with a phone call. I'm sure you're familiar with Free ERISA or Free. I'm, I'm told there's a thing called Free 5500. Sure. I never used that, but Free ERISA, most financial advisors are aware of it. It's a database of based on zip codes of all custodians of 401ks. So what happens is, um, uh, uh, what all I do is I'll put in a zip code that I'm targeting. It spits back all of the custodians, some of which are CFOs, some of which are CEOs. Once the company gets over a certain size, they've usually delegated that responsibility to a CFO or controller or something. If you're targeting that, great. 
been targeted. If you're not, what you really want is companies in the five to twenty million in range in revenue. So, and those are the ones that really need us. The ones that are doing like three hundred million, five hundred million, they've got the Goldman Sachs of the world's catering to them. Goldman Sachs doesn't want to deal with this this lower end side, but and they're getting ignored, right? So what happens is is you simply um, write them handwritten letters. Now, if you're under a certain age, you probably don't know how to handwrite. <laughs> but if you're over a certain age, you really appreciate it. Like remember, like once, have you ever received a handwritten letter, business wise? Have you ever? I don't think I have. Well, I got to tell you, you know, I'm 51 years old. When I do, it is ridiculously rare. I literally hang on to the letter. So picture learning cursive and writing letters to guys my age. By the way, I've surveyed these these um, CEOs. I have a large survey of privately held CEOs in the country. Beat Ohio State at their own game, and I've beat the various uh, CEO peer advisory uh, organizations at their own game. Uh, the peak age is 52 years old. So you're really talking to me. And um, I appreciate handwritten letters, so I write them. So the way it is, I boil down um, uh, the laundry list of all uh, custodians in a zip code I'm targeting down to which one of these industries is likely to thrive. Now, I actually run an exercise that I've had uh, 5,750 companies so far go through. I'll have 1,500 more this year, and we uh, it's actually Chapter 8 in my book. It's a laundry list of all the industries that will thrive in the next 15 years based on some pretty sound assumptions. So the first lens I look at is 5,500 database. The second lens I look at them through is which one are on that list of the ones that will thrive in the next 15 years. Target 10 of those companies, and I send them a handwritten letter each week for 13 weeks. Wait, the same and company? A letter same company. each week? Yeah, I used to do it one each and then in the bad days, I would get really good responses, but in the good days, I wouldn't. So if you actually write a handwritten letter once a week, each week for 13 weeks to 10 companies, you'll get a 20 to 25% response rate. They will call you. Huh. In, the, in the bad days, you get a 50% response rate. And the real reason why is this. This is the reason why I'm bringing it up, especially to someone like yourself. What I'm looking to do is to help advisors add counter-cyclical revenue streams to their practice. So picture the mom and pops. They, they want to talk to you or go dark on you uh, in communications directly proportional to whatever the stock market's doing. The better the stock market's doing, the more they want to talk to you. As soon as the market starts to go down, they go dark. And it's uh, not an easy time to be in our profession. You know, uh, the valuation of the practice is cut in half. Uh, the actual... Um, residual income coming in actually decreases proportionally to the stock market. Not a fun time. Well, guess when CEOs want to talk to you? As soon as the market turns. Because they don't know how to be strategic. It shocks me how few of them think strategically. They need to build strategies when the market's great. They need to learn how to be contrarians, but they're not. They're very tactical and reactive. So as soon as the market collapses, all these guys come out of the woodwork looking for answers, and I want you to be the answer man. So what ends up happening is if you pepper into your practice CEOs, it'll be frustrating at first. You'll be like, ah, do I really want to deal with these guys, big egos, stuff like that, and all sorts of ways how to handle that situation too. The situation, though, is it creates a counter-cyclical revenue stream. And the beauty of it is, especially as they're starting to approach their retirement years, and more of these companies will change hands in the next 15 years than ever before in American history, in some way, shape, or form, they're going to be ringing that cash register. Guess who they want to turn to? A fiduciary they can trust. I, I got want it. it to be you. I got, you got it. it. Yes, so that all is we're fantastic. Talking about is, well, and, and real deal here is now I'm in the New York market. We have the worst uh, direct mail response rate of any uh, counties in the United States, and I get a 25 to 50 percent response rate off of it. God, how long so, does it take you to write I mean, 10 letters a week? Not long. It's usually like about an hour or so. It's actually like a hand stamp. It's a, you know, at first a little bit of a pain, but eventually you get the handle on it. It's not very expensive. It costs you like maybe two. $250 a quarter, you know, I'm talking about huge money. Um, the trick is how do you write the letter? And then how do you handle the phone call? So if you have a few more minutes for me, 
the uh, the letters want to be as corny as all get out. Okay. So you want to be cornier and cornier and cornier. Now, I don't know. Uh, this still has to be tested in other markets, but in New York, you wouldn't think corny flies. It flies awesome. So, uh, like, that's the ones I get the most response rate. I started using all sorts of different cards, like these things called love pop cards, where when you open it up, it pops up like a like a three-year-old's pop-up book. Uh-huh. Ones with coffee, and it would say, hey, you're ready to have that cup of coffee in a conversation, question mark, my cell phone, big signature, that type of thing. Um, one guy had been away, called me up, and he said, dude, you sent me like 10 cards in a row. I just got all of them. What's this about? That leads me to the conversation. So if we're done talking about the cards conversation is challenging too and really what it comes down to is they're hearing your context so all i simply do is say to them well um how much time do you have for this conversation now they, remember they've called me mm-hmm. partially the reason why i keep it only to 10 so i can memorize who they are and when they call me they sit back and say, nine times out of ten they'll say however long it took you to write those cards <laughs> Then, then I'll say to them, I say, listen, you know, I want to see long, uh, business on Long Island thrive. And frankly, owning a small business on Long Island is like, it's like having a bad girlfriend or bad boyfriend if it's a female CEO. And, uh, and they all crack up as soon as they hear that. They're like, I treat you great in the good days. What you treat you like in the bad days? They all crack up. And I said, you know, normally I get together with CEOs just to see can we help you. Uh, but we have to agree that I might not be able to or vice versa. And if we do, we just shake hands as friends, no foul. Sound good? And I meet him for a Starbucks. I ask him two questions. What's the biggest strategic issue affecting your company in the next 24 months? And what, if anything, is keeping you awake at night? And it's like popping a water balloon. They will talk for 45 straight minutes. Do they routinely. see you at this point? Are they looking at you as a financial advisor through your practice? Or are you positioning yourself no. as an M&A advisor? No, nothing. All I'm saying is uh, all I'm going to do is help you if I can. And if I can't, no blood, no foul. So all I do is sit back and say, you know what? Um, let's say the company's too small or it's not something I like or I don't like the person. So, Or um, their challenge is really outside my wheelhouse, like they're getting divorced or you know whatever because there's total drama in their lives at all times. So 87.7% of them report trouble sleeping at night. And that's not like not... I know some of that's prostate problems, but not all of it. <laughs> the deal is like, okay, so I just listen to the problem because really what we want to do as financial advisors is we want to talk to people who have complicated issues, let's call them problems for lack of a better word, and are willing to have a conversation. So sometimes they're intrigued is the reason why they're having a conversation with me. And you know, when we sit down, I just say, well, how much time do you have for this conversation and what were you hoping to get out of it? And uh, they'll usually tell me if I allocated 45 minutes, an hour, or whatever, I simply say, yeah, me too. And then um, they'll say, I wanted to get m- to know more about your organization. Okay, that's fine. Me too. So then I ask them the two strategic questions, and then by then they're just like, how many people it's safe for them to have a conversation with? The answer is so rare. And frankly, most of them, they rely on their CPAs and attorneys as counselors, and CPAs and attorneys are terrible business people. Mm-hmm. Terrible. They're technicians. So, yeah, well, they're also, it's like, you, you know, the, the CEO has figured out they know more than them. They've outgrown the relationship. Still want the relationship for the obvious reasons, but they can't use them as a strategic advisor because they're not stra- strategic. And you know, frankly, that's not the wheelhouse of attorneys or CPAs. So what they're looking for is someone like that, and then what it does is it actually creates a um, a network of people you can refer to them because you got to want to see business thrive. And if you do, they'll sense that. If you don't, they're not going to sense it, so don't be inauthentic. Then you sit back and go, okay, well, listen, I think I can help you, uh, assuming you can. And um, this is how I can help you. And you give them a lot of reasons. You say, but there's a catch. There has to be a retainer involved. I can't just do this for my ego. You know, you know, my, my family needs me to make money still. And uh, I said, the way I normally do it with my CEOs is I take over the 401k relationship, and then I throw in all the coaching for free. And if you'd like to, you're welcome to talk to one of my CEOs, uh, you know, about the, um, how we work together. And then they form, like, blood brother relationships with you. It's, it's awesome. It's really super cool. God, so that is fantastic. Uh, it, 
Thank you so much. So the uh, it's like this actually is the first time I've had an op- an opportunity to on purpose talk to the advisor community. Normally I do it mainly for CEOs, and sometimes they're the advisors. But like I want to tackle this challenge that we have going forward of the private middle markets thriving because they're not known. You know, everybody knows about publicly traded companies. Everybody knows about small business because they either have a grant to study it or professors study public because they're, well, this is going to sound terrible, but they're kind of lazy. (laughs) Most professors study their students for psychological studies and how are you going to learn how to run a better business from a student? Very rare. Um, They don't study private companies, so they like these best-kept secrets. So I've been studying them for the last uh, decade and I think personally, the single best, um, most qualified advisor they could have is a financial advisor because of the fiduciary relationship. They won't get it from anywhere else. So, Mark, so I want to help. I, I appreciate this. The way you articulated your process is just pure, pure value to any advisor listening to this podcast. I would be doing listeners a disservice if I did not circle back on something before we wrap up and talk about your research as it relates to the industries and sectors you feel are going to thrive in the economy going forward. Okay, no problem. So fire away. So which sectors are going to thrive in the economy going forward based (laughs) on your research? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right, so what happens is the – I I would think that this borders on um, empirical research. Now, I'm not a PhD, so don't hold me to that. The situation, though, is 5,750 companies so far have participated in an exercise that I run. Once I've taught them about how demographics work and how, like, you know, if they're selling a product or service to 55-year-olds, well, there's less 55-year-olds every year for the next 14 straight years. That's the thing Harry Dent was worried about. It's the thing most economists are worried about. It's not going to close the world to come to an end. It just won't. But if you think your uh, business model is going to still thrive and all of that, you're not, it's not likely to happen. So once I get them up to that speed, I simply then turn to them and I ask them, what is a classically recession-resistant business model? And what is a business that benefits from the aging of the population? You know, think, um, what's the difference between a hurricane and a hurricane? You know, when you're 25 years old, a hurricane is a drink in New Orleans. When you're 75 years old, it's a cane you buy on late night television. <laughs> yep. The spending patterns change, so are they relevant? So all you simply have to do is look at some very simple things. Maslow's hierarchy of needs are tend to be recession resistant. You know, shelter, heat, food, stuff like that. The uh, the other one is what's going to benefit from people getting older. So healthcare is a is a the number one category. It's the reason why it's actually the hottest category in M&A right now. In fact, the two hottest categories are M&A, uh, or, uh, healthcare and software. The only way to get a higher valuation than one of those two is to be in software for healthcare. That's mm-hmm. the highest valuation. So what you're looking at is healthcare or software with a healthcare bent. Other ones are, believe it or not, pet supplies. Has the highest ROI in the last 15 years, and I think that trend's going to continue. Although it took me by surprise, I thought with empty nester spending syndrome, what guy would ever want a dog ever again? You know what I mean? Like the, your 14 year old son talks you into this dopey golden retriever, and now you got to feed him and walk him and do everything your son told he would do and won't. So you got to take care of it. It's like as soon as the kid's out of the house, like forget that. I'm never going to have one again. Well, it turns out. They're not going to have a golden retriever. They're going to have a teacup little poodle they're going to put into a, a baby carriage and walk as if it's a, a newborn baby. And spoil. You know? Say again. And spoil and spend that. a bunch of money on. Yeah, and spoil. Yeah, and have like car seats for it. So uh, that category is a rock star category. Anything that's going to be positively affected by the aging of the population, like MRI machines, medical devices, hearing aids, uh, home health care, um, hospice places, uh, assisted living facilities. The things that I'd be concerned about is clothing. You know, just judging from my parents coming back up from Florida, uh, you know, clothing's not real big for 90-year-olds. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. They, they still come back in the same clothes they moved there in 25 years ago. And frankly, I can't wait till I'm like that also. So it's like uh, trendy things aren't big on my list. Um, you know, like fashion, stuff like that, Um, wacky things that millennials might be doing before they have kids. I don't like to consider that trends. I want to see people have kids 
And then, then what do they spend money on? That's a trend. You know, anything that affects the development of a child, you can count on as that child develops, you know, from one years old to about 18 years old, they're going to hit very predictable patterns. When you can bake that into your, uh, your process and your business plan, you're better off. So that's some of them. We just did a video on it on the on the video channel. It should be out in a, you know, by the end of the week or so about what are the top ten. But you can actually identify what are the top ten countries to actually invest into using demographics too. You know, so there's so much we can cover. I don't think we can cover everything in one podcast. No. So I don't want to I don't want to kill you with too much detail. But Mark. the deal is is that the the um, it's all readily available and it's free. All this information. Mark, I love your passion. This has been an incredibly informative podcast. Uh, your book uh, entitled uh, Megatrends and the Next Economy, where could listeners find that and find out more information about you and your companies? Okay, so the, um, the, the book Metatrends, it's with a T. Metatrends is actually owned by Nesbitt. The uh, Metatrends is on Amazon. Uh, that's the main place you can get it right now. It's on both uh, um, digital and uh, uh, paperback. So that's the main place you can get it. How you can stay in touch with me if you want to. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. My last name is uh, spelt like parrot, but it has two R's and two T's. Also, we just launched a uh, YouTube channel to do like, uh, I don't know what you call it, video blog, something like that. The uh, That one's called Metatrends with Mark Parrott. So the w- I want to stay in touch with you, though. What you're doing is really good work. Well, listen, I appreciate it, and I'd love to have you on a future podcast because you have just have so much fantastic research and information. Thanks so much for coming on this episode. 